All right. Welcome back, everyone, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. As always, if you support this venture, you could head over and join the YouTube channel at just $1 a month, or you could support at any level at patreon.com slash tawahado. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash T-E-W-A-H-I-D-O. Today, my special guest is Kyle. How are you doing today? I'm not too shabby. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. Um, we met on on Twitter, and it's mm -hmm. it's so funny. I've met so many different Habesha that have different perspectives. I've had someone who's worked for Barack Obama on this program. Mm -hmm. I've had someone who identifies as a frog on this program. And a lot of different people have, um, I would say, like a, a more mild analysis of the politics of the United States. But time after time, again, I kept seeing you noticing a lot of same things that that i was noticing on a on a deeper level so mm -hmm. on a kind of uh bigger stage what what do you think sparked your interest in 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 politics because you obviously know more <laughs> than a cursory glance <laughs> that is a big question um what sparked my interest in politics i mean i don't know i guess just from a very young age i i i've just been perceptive about these kinds of things that they happen and um, when people make decisions at these high levels, it, it has an effect on our day-to-day -day lives. And and for uh, for me, I, I would say politics is just the means through which change is affected or or or, or not affected. And uh, that that the whole process it, it's not pretty. It's not it's not easy. It's not. Uh, they may not in any normal sense be even be good, but um, I, I'm not one of those people that tries to say, oh, everything is political, food is political, mm -hmm. uh, music is political. I mean, it, because to be fair to that perspective, on a certain level, it kind of is. Uh, but I'm not one of those people that likes to politicize everything. But I, I think at the end of the day, it, it's, it's something that's inescapable. And um, it's just something I could never help but uh, not notice. I, I feel never that. Help, never that notice. Yeah, um, especially, you know, my dad pushed like many Ethiopian fathers engineering on me as a young kid. And uh -huh. you know, I rejected that. But in the sense of societal engineering, that mm. is what, you know, is taking place. That never stopped fascinating me. You know, like as a kid, I was someone who played with a lot of connects and Legos, which is why he thought it was he, he thought it wasn't just a typical ethiopian thing but hey this yeah. kid has a an aptitude for connecting these things mm -hmm. and um i'm sort of getting back into that now with a uh, training in some software but mm. the societal level it's it's interesting the objects versus people <laughs> because yeah. people are, are not objects the food thing you said stuck sticks out to me here in los angeles i've i've seen it in new york as well but here in los angeles uh, i think it was new york and brooklyn and in Los Angeles, it was Hollywood slash West Hollywood. I don't know if it was technically in West Hollywood or in Hollywood proper. There was a lot of hubbub, and I had some friends mm -hmm. who were pushed in this as well, and, and some of my outer circles about the debate about Chick Fil A. And the funny yeah. thing about Chick Fil A is it's a Christian-owned company, which really was minding its own business. But when pressed by the press and asked its position on standard Christian things. They mm -hmm. said the very predictable answer that would be there. And if right. you go, it'd be one thing if it was a shitty company. But everyone's memes online are about how incredible the service are. Yes. <laughs> like they, they'll jump out the window to serve you uh, pre-pandemic and probably during pandemic as well. Is that one of the things you were thinking about? And what do you, what do you make of like the Chick-fil-A stuff? It's interesting that um, given... I don't want to. I don't want to. I'm going to give a number, and it's going to be wrong. Maybe I don't know when this really uh, that this was five, six years ago that this all really flared up. The whole Chick Fil A controversy. Maybe it was 2014. Maybe it was that's that's 2014 is like seven years ago, man. <laughs> uh, that's scary. Um, but it was a while ago, and I remember that. And it's interesting because that you no know, when that started, when that really became a controversy. Chick Fil A was nowhere in here in New York. They they didn't have any. I don't think they had any stores, and they didn't have much of a presence. Now, uh, you flash forward, you know, the five, six, seven years, um, that they 
they have a number of branches across the city and across the region, and they become quite popular, and people don't really seem to mind them that much. So it's interesting uh, be, that, you know, some people that, that we say nowadays are uncancelable. And I'm wondering <laughs> if Chick-fil-A is an uncancelable restaurant. Because there have been a lot, a lot of places that have been really mired down. Let's so about, I mean, this, this whole trend of needing to pick a side and needing to make a statement. And I think we've seen a lot of this over the past year or two. Uh, with the latest wave of the Black Lives Matter movement, where every corporation is expected to take a stand to put out a statement about how Black Lives Matter or, or the cause du jour, Black Lives Matter, Asian lives, right, Asian hate, uh, elections should be free and fair, uh, or the climate or, or whatever. Uh, um, but so there's that issue, and and if, if, if and if any if the corporate leadership of a company just so happens to hold a uh, a view that does not fit the contemporary doctrine, that's the whole issue. But it's interesting that when we talk about proving political, it, it's more goes down to the cultural appropriation issue, is that does this person have the right, or or really, does this person have the right to be making this this cuisine in, this, in such a way? Um, and it's, it, it's been quite a minefield because you've stepped on people who, uh, who have mainly white people who have been experimenting with cuisines that are not their own, with a usually <laughs> different kinds of Asian cuisines, and they're getting very called out on it because if some person doesn't like one thing, uh, one way, one person has made one dish, all of a sudden that's a cultural appropriation controversy, and uh, that's a very very fraught. That's a very very fraught, and 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 it goes to absurd levels. I remember reading about this uh, restaurant in Toronto, and what was it was it a, it was a rice bowl or was it i think it was just rice in general they were they were making oh here's our rice dish and it's like oh you can't do this you're appropriating asian cuisine and and, and you get to the point and it's like like oh and i think they're saying it was vietnamese cuisine it's like it, not only this one cuisine has rice <laughs> right it's as close to universal as you can get and it becomes increasingly uh tendentious uh tendentious and tenuous these kinds of claims. Uh, so even when you're, e you're, you're eating the food, you have to consider, oh, who made it? Is it authentic? Uh, is authenticity in itself a problematic uh, ideal? You, 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 have, you have this pop up. Uh, so, so even eating food these days can be a very fraught. And I guess some people will say that, well, you have to be, it's just about being mindful. But at the end of the day, sometimes you're just hungry and you want to have a bon me without <laughs> having to worry about it. That's right. You don't want your allyship in question just mm -hmm. because you like fried chicken or you like rice, which are some of the, as you said, the most universal foods. And Dave Chappelle many moons ago said, what's wrong with you if you don't like these things? If you don't like watermelon, fried chicken, rice, it's not, mm -hmm. it's not a wonder or a spectacle that somebody likes these things. <laughs> it's, right. more, it's more of an outlier when someone doesn't like those particular mm -hmm. yes. foods. And, and it's funny because, um, you know, these people are clearly thinking about politics in a mm -hmm. way that's diametrically opposed to the way that, that I'm thinking about it. And yet, if I'm trying to be most charitable, I think the best case is just attribution. Just mm -hmm. don't pretend that you made these foods up in these particular combinations. Yeah. Like, know that there's a history of preparing these foods. And, and I think that that does as much of the work that they're trying to do and <laughs> not trying to dwell on it further. It gets ridiculous when I see young Ethiopians caught up mm -hmm. in some of that type of food politics, because then I push back at them and I say, well, have you ever eaten kutfo with injera? If you've eaten kutfo with injera, you've committed cultural appropriation. <laughs> kutfo is supposed to be kocho, eaten nothing. with kocho, and kocho is the Amharic word, but the gurage word is actually uh, wussa. So unless you eat it with wissa and you have the leaves underneath and you have like six yeah, different types of aib that I see whipped out at my yes. homie's place during uh, the exaltation of the cross, the mascara celebration, go, yeah. then you're not doing it right. You're culturally appropriating. And it's um, people don't even think about it because they think about Ethiopian nationalism mm. as, an, as the nation state so much. They forget about the individual components of food and they might tacitly kind of know that kutfo is gurage, but then they yeah. forget about, they want to use their northern bread. You know, it uh -huh. doesn't work. <laughs>
Well, well, I, 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 I you know, my, my Ethiopian side is, is all Gurage, actually. So, I, you know, I don't know if I have the authority to do this, but I give everyone a pass to eat uh, as much Kitfo, uh, Kitfo Benjera as much as they want. So <laughs> That's good. That's good. They'll take no. a pass from you. <laughs> I'm not sure I have the authority to give it, but uh, it's true. <laughs> it's, it's fascinating. And I, I wonder, uh, you don't, I mean, people don't try to experiment that much with Ethiopian food. I mean, there are a couple of places in D.C. I heard that was doing something like it, but... And most of it really do stick to the Injara Bawot kind of There's, uh, arrangement. There are two uh, in LA, and they're mm -hmm. both vegan spots that are most experimental. One that's more mildly mm -hmm. is Rahel's. It's a vegan spot within Little Ethiopia. Yeah, and yeah. she'll have, like, I think, certain juices and a few, like, um, what did I see the other day? She said it was a, a vegan, um, oh, my God. Dulet. She said vegan dulet, for example. Oh, yes, but it yes, was yes, made yes. of mushrooms, you know. And then uh, Azla Vegan, which is on its own in Lamert Park, uh, made famous by Dom Kennedy and a few other rappers, a kind of mm -hmm. black-owned area where there are a lot of black-owned businesses in Los Angeles. And Azla Vegan has, like, uh, tofu tacos mm -hmm. and will have kaser, which is like the beets, but with quinoa. So, you know, those mm -hmm. two are the most, especially Azla, but those two restaurants are the vegan ones and they're the most experimental, but all the other restaurants in LA are, are standard. Yeah, no, uh, yet so I had uh, yet some do that when I was, like, I, I was in Ethiopia and, until about a month ago, uh, for since the start of the year. And you know, they, 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 they've had it there. I had it, it was made with a uh, cauliflower. Oh, uh, very, very that nice. sounds nice. Yeah. But you're right, there are, there are two places like that. And, and I think one is called uh, Ross, uh, plant-based. And they're, they're, they're both in Brooklyn. Uh, one's in um, Crown Heights. And the other is, ca is called, uh, uh, there's a Buni Cafe and there's a Buna Cafe. I think it's the Buna is, uh, is, is the one. And, and they're, they're more in, uh, I, guess you, I guess you could say Bushwick, East of Williamsburg. I'm not entirely sure where the line is drawn. And yeah, you you see things with like seitan and tofu and and and, and stuff like that, uh, but they don't necessarily go that far out. And but I do wonder, has sort of the the ethnic politics spill over from home to to the diaspora, or or I mean honestly, you could argue argue they go the other way. I, I've never been I've never been to Minneapolis. I, I wonder if you go to Minneapolis, if you'll find Oromo restaurants and, and not Ethiopian restaurants. Uh, I've I've always been too I honestly I've always been too scared to look. I I've been to Minneapolis like six mm -hmm. times mm -hmm. and I haven't seen that. But I mm -hmm. will say the thing I came across more that startled me mm -hmm. was more people. If you ask them if they're Habesha or Ethiopian, um, will fight you on a technicality and will yes. say that they are neither of those things. Mm -hmm. And that that threw me off. But then I I came to realize okay this this is the game people are doing. And uh, I came to realize, you know, I can, I can appreciate the, the clear separatists for who they are mm. because at least they're being honest about what their politics are, is that they want to mm. carve Ethiopia up and the majority of them want to take Addis Ababa. So yes. at least they're being open and honest about what they're doing as opposed to the many people trying to, I think, get to the same goals or ends through subterfuge. Yes. And at the same time, realize that, I have a very opposite view of that <laughs> and yeah. i don't think that that would be a pretty situation you know no no and when i was in Addis, i was trying to tell people uh you know i had some contacts and uh, made some friends in the diplomatic community and i was trying to tell them uh and they're pretty sympathetic to begin with but i was trying to tell them that uh if, if you're trying to reckon with that with people di diaspora based activists from or tigre who are romo uh, and they're calling for these different policies, and they barely there's a very clear uh, separatist subtext. Uh, the question becomes, what is the end game, and and, and is that something you really you're really willing to tolerate? Mm -hmm. Which is that a country of a hundred plus hundred ten million people being dismembered and broken up uh, would not be in any way, piece or shape, or form a peaceful process, it, and it it would make. Um, what's happened in Syria, in, in, in Yemen, look like child's play, and it would unleash our refugee crisis, the likes to which I don't think we've ever seen before in the world, 
tens of millions of people literally trying to flee the country. And I, I, I think that there's the two options that in Ethiopia, that is a, 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 a powerhouse, a, a, a beacon of stability for the region, for the horn, which is really Ethiopia in some bits. I, I'm a bit skeptical of the term the horn, because if you look at it, if you look at the population of that region, it's like what? 125, 130 million, 110 million of those are Ethiopian. <laughs> and there, there, this is important. Yes. There is no ethnic group mm. that exists in Eritrea, Djibouti, or Somalia that doesn't exist in Ethiopia. Yes. The one exception are the Raishda, which are Saudi Arabians who came 200 years ago. Yeah, I guess I mean, you can argue at the Bilan, the Saho. And, 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 and those are all related. Those are all related. Those are all various Cushitic and Semitic groups related yeah. to, directly related with intelligible languages, mm -hmm. same religion, same food culture. We talked about food, right? Yeah. There is the, everything. Um, <laughs> yeah, even, even the Eritrean ruler, you know, people have, have pointed to, uh, certain ties to the Tigrayan nobility of Ethiopia. So, I mean, it's a funny, it, everywhere. And uh, Djibouti, when people, when I tell people about Djibouti, it's the funniest thing. There's no Djiboutin. There's no Djiboutin no. ethnicity. They're on the West, Afar, and on the East, Somali. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I don't want to get too deep into that before I start going about all, all these countries are fake, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> uh, Ethiopian empire, bring it back. Exactly. 100%, <laughs> completely unironically, completely unironically. But uh, that's a, maybe that's a topic for another day. But I think the interesting parallels we can find um, between Ethiopia and between the contemporary United States is the increasing importance and centrality of identities, various identities, mm -hmm. ethnic identities, religious identities, uh, sexual identities, uh, cultural identities, um, to pol political discourse and to not just political life, but ordinary life. And that that has been, I guess, the, the defining trend in the past 10 years. And we've seen the uh, emergence of it, I would say, as something that we could locate on the left We've seen the right wing reaction, and we've seen the counter reaction, and uh, that that trend is is being challenged on many fronts. But I I don't think it's one that that is going away. That's right. That's right. And so, do do you think that it should go away? Do you do you think that um, you know because we see them responding like escalating it? Like what's the is the solution to to go neutral because this is funny back to the food politics and mm. the corporate like uh dave smith i've heard the the comic dave smith has pushed this idea a lot but i've heard other people say this too it's like the corporations are pushing the aesthetic politics over functional politics of yes. like repeating dogmas and doctrine because it's easier to do that than to focus on the actual economic inequalities you see people right. like shoe, shoe on head on youtube and twitter glenn greenwald everywhere that he he goes especially with his frequent tucker carlson appearances which piss mm. off uh, a lot of people the emergence of Substack, all these people um even 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 the kind of jacobin communist community that springs out of brooklyn and the various podcasts they have and the young turks is like this idea of let's put ethnicity aside for class analysis and an emphasis on trying to build class unity. But then certain people are saying that the neutrality in those issues is is reifying the issues of, of ethnicity. So, you know, do you do you go for like like in California uh, last November, you know, we get to vote, vote on our legislation. One of the mm. funny amendments that we got to talk about, I talked about a little bit on my program, somebody pushing stuff then and, and I gave her a little pushback it was a friend of mine is this idea of in the law, do you discriminate with the law or do you try not discriminating? And so yes. the, the laws on the books were no discrimination with the law, but people said that, you know, this is the debate between equality and equity that's been increasing. And mm. so the, the law that was trying to be changed was to make it more quote unquote equitable and less equal. That failed in California as of now, but the trend is obviously in that direction. Yeah. Um, um, yes, I think and that that and that ballot, that particular proposition related, uh, at least touched upon um, uh, admissions to public universities. Is that right? 
Yeah, I think it was all encompassing. It was, it was yeah. all encompassing in the terms of should the government of California be able to try to fix discrimination through discrimination right. or should it fix it through being indiscriminate? Right. Uh, it's interesting. That's an interesting phrasing way to put it because, uh, yeah, you, you do have this. It's interesting because, <laughs> well, it is interesting. Uh, you have, a, I think you have a very large contingent of people who, uh, who prefer a race based or an identity based analysis in its own right, uh, as opposed to anyone that is, uh, I think, based on a more a more of an economic um, understanding of the issues. And it's interesting because if you look at there's some, there's some very recent polling and recent studies, I think they'll come out really in just in the past month on this issue. And if you look at them, you you, you find that people uh, overall find the class-based argument or the, inc or the economic based arguments more compelling on a wide, wide array of issues. I think it was, um, it was data for progress that the, the no, 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 data for progress of polling on housing, but it was a recent paper, I forget by whom exactly, uh, that, that really measured the effects of the various arguments on a wide array of issues like housing, climate policy, policing, uh, voting rights, and phrase it one in a more of a race-based way that so we need to uh, we need to rectify this uh, racially based injustice as opposed to a class-based argument that we need to benefit lower income people or we need to serve more a wider array of americans um and across the board the class-based argument was the more compelling one to the general public however there is a very large contingent, and I think Amad Iglesias has written something very recently on this, so I want to disclose this is not an original idea of mine, uh, that uh, there's a very, and I've seen this in practice, to be honest, uh, that there's a very large contingent of people, uh, particularly amongst the, the, the sort of nonprofit sector that funds much of these activist groups uh, to, to really focus on the role of race, role of identity, and when they're funding uh, various nonprofits and they're funding uh, various groups. Uh, they they want to see the race based analysis. They want to see the race based the race based the theory of change and motivation for what they're doing and how they're going to advance uh, racial justice and under undermine uh, the um, injustices that have been perpetrated against people of color or or other underprivileged groups historically. And so that, that really shifts the way they think. And some groups are able to really have the sort of a dual track messaging. They have one sort of track for the, for the, for the donors and one for the broader public. But many, equally as many, probably more, uh, just adopt one, sort of one sort of frame of reference. And that's okay. We need to emphasize racial justice. And it's interesting because you, what you lead there, and we're seeing this now, and I guess in our local mayoral elections here in New York, with Andrew Yang, who has really yes. stormed his way to the top of the polls here, uh, is that you have a very um, a coterie of sort of act various activist groups that don't really have any kind of mass membership, uh, who have come out very strongly against him and are basically ready to criticize anything that he says uh, at a, at the hair triggers uh, at the at a hair, basically, hair triggers notice, or however it is you say that. <laughs> yeah, um, they, they, they're trying to make him as anti woman for some like yeah. off comments about. Yeah. <laughs> anti woman, anti gay, anti Hispanic, and like, you know, any kind of thing they can throw at him. And I, I mean, to be fair, I'm not that, I'm not that big of a fan of him. I, 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 don't necessarily, I don't necessarily see that much substance in what he suggests, uh, and as particularly with relevance to the particular conditions of it here in New York. But um, regardless of that, they, they, what, what irritates them about him is has less to do, again, to your point, it has less to do with the, whatever the substance of what he's proposing as to simply the style and the aesthetic that he is, he is promoting of someone who's this outsider, who's this sort of tech bro, even though he's, he's, his tech background is not that deep, actually. He ran a test prep company, and, and that, that's about it. He, um, and he affects a sort of easygoing image that that's not studiously progressive. That's not. Um, it doesn't genuflect to the kinds of groups that they that <laughs> regard themselves as important. And as a result, they hate him with a passion. Um, 
but the interesting thing about these groups, like I said, is that they're very small. They have a, don't have any kind of mass membership. They're not, they're not like the old unions. They're not like the Rotary. Uh, they're not like you know the daughters of you know I guess the League of Women Voters. These these older line uh, civic organizations, civil society organizations that had large memberships that were had a much more uh, maybe a democratic internal structure, but it was membership based and it was more responsive as opposed to say maybe a dozen or a half a dozen staffers. And there are all these groups that exist in the ecosystem, ratifying each other's views and uh, affirming each other's uh, and cross endorsing each other's messages, um, and and providing sort of the smokescreen of a sort of 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 a, of, a, of a civil society ecosystem, but and actually represent very good people. So you have oh, there was an article I think it was in um, was it in the Times? Was it in the Atlantic? Where, where was it? it? It was an article about how Asian American organizations have been lining up against Andrew Yang. Uh, and again, it's just these kind of organizations that are just tiny organizations that don't really represent anyone. And the only person in the article who had been, who could reasonably claim to represent a reasonable number of people was actually, I think, a state assembly person. And he was like, yeah, I, I think he has some interesting ideas. Um, he was, he was much, uh, I think it was, uh, it was he. He was much less vituperative against Yang than anyone else quoted in that article. So it was interesting just to see uh, that discrepancy between um, that what I guess the the broader public feels and and what these sort of this sort of self appointed group of people feel. And so, like I said, this group of people, these groups are all funded by the same number of, of foundations, uh, and and the foundations have their own agenda which are looking to fund, and, and that pushes the conversation in a certain direction. Yeah, I to talk about someone who kind of balances the race and class analysis, although I thoroughly disagree with him, especially after hearing him on Dad Russell's program, was Michael Brooks, who passed away last year. Mm -hmm. But I thought he was brilliant at at mixing those things together. And especially when I hear you talking about the funding of these nonprofits, it seems like the isolation of race at the expense of class and this analysis helps a kind of emotional appeal of the people who are involved in the nonprofits. Right. At the same time, it sets up an us versus them mentality and, mm. you know, setting up what people are you know, looking at and calling a race war um, potentially in the, in the United States, which, you know, has had certain maybe skirmishes up to this, up to this point. And, mm. uh, you know, thank God either way that the Chauvin trial went the way that it went because, mm. you know, people pro and against it, you know, people, people who were super pro police made a statement yeah. and people on Fox news made a statement mm -hmm. that agreed with a statement that Dr. Umar Johnson is saying on the breakfast club was mm -hmm. that it was an economic decision more so than an issue of justice or, or mercy. And so, you know, just <laughs> thank God that there's some relative peace and stability yes. in the, in the aftermath of that, if not still people, critiquing the Raiders <laughs> for repeating the words of, of uh, George Floyd's own family um, mm -hmm. and again, applying these purity tests. So it's, it's um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Like I said, I, I really haven't met that many uh, Ethiopians who've paid attention to politics in this way. There are a lot of people again, who most who I've encountered are obsessed with the aesthetics. So I appreciate having these conversations with you. I remember one of the things that you pointed out one time that I, I think I literally threw my phone and, and bust out laughing was you said something like in your face to the West Coast Straussians. Now I could tell you most of the Ethiopians I know don't even know who the Straussians are, let alone mm. the difference between the East Coast and the, the West Coast <laughs> group of them. And I think it had something to do with like, Michael Over Anton's exit from the 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 Trump regime, or or something to that effect. I don't remember what it precisely was. I can uh, well, it's interesting. I, I I could tell you what the West Coast Straussians believe, but I couldn't tell you what the East Coast Straussians believe. And I, I know what the West Coast Straussians believe is is um they place a unique role, uh, or unique emphasis on on the Declaration of Independence as really the founding document of, of the country and its role in understanding. Uh, the laws um, as, and, and its relevance to, I guess, constitutional uh, interpretation and trying to understand the sort of meaning of the founders, but also in understanding what what the United States is supposed to stand, what, what 
United States is supposed to mean, what it's supposed to stand for, what it represents, uh, that is embodied in the Declaration of Independence. Um, what, uh, by contrast, the East Coast Ossians, I, I, I couldn't tell you, but, but, um, but yes, no, I, I, like I, I think, said, I think the big difference that I would notice is probably they're more policy oriented, like specifically yes. policy oriented because they're right. B and DC, whereas the ones here in LA or just outside LA, east of LA, actually in Claremont, yeah. maybe they're more focused on the big picture narrative and right, ideas. Right, 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 right. There's, 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 there's a theoretical difference and then there's also, I guess, a more a functional difference. That's what I, I know the libertarian higher. community well and I, I'd say it's the equivalent of like the the Mises group is very kind of big picture theory yeah. and places like Reason and Cato in DC are very policy oriented. Yes, 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 yes. And I, I used to, I, I, I have had my, I've put my uh, toes that well, I, I, I'm very bad with idioms. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> uh, You've gotten your feet wet. I've gotten my feet wet. Thank you. In in um or dip my toes, whatever. In a number of different circles, I've 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 been to uh, libertarian circles. I used to so so spend a decent amount of time with a bunch of left 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 type groups here. Well, not like um not DSA. I wasn't in the DSA, but mm -hmm. <laughs> obviously, but I, I socialized with them a lot. And this is m mainly more pre-pandemic, uh, I, I, I've been involved with Manhattan Institute, which is a more mainstream conservative group. And, 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 and most of my day-to-day -day stuff is very much the general Democratic Party politics of New York. So I, I've been, I've never been deep in one group, but I've always been, if not necessarily on the periphery, I've, I've been flitting around them, trying to uh, yeah. gain these, pick up these ideas, understand more, and see, see what, um, what what solutions they offer to the, the, the issue the ailments of our time uh, does that but, bug them well it's interesting i i tend to um i represent myself differently <laughs> to each of these different groups mm -hmm. um so for instance whenever i i joke whenever i'm around a bunch of uh, a more left leaning leaning groups, particularly not even, not so much a liberal group as it's a leftist group, I, I will emphasize my affinity with uh, Elizabeth Brunig, who mm -hmm. won the rest of the times. And yeah. I, I, I- The left choose, Catholic, right? Exactly. And I find that that's a very, that's a very, very useful alibi for my own politics, which are not that left wing. I mean, they're not, are, are, my name, if you were to really argue with me, you could say that I'm not left wing at all. Um, but I find that I'm able to really emphasize my proximity to her views and her worldview. And she's popular enough in those circles that people are like, oh, okay. And, yeah, it's, and, it's and, someone yeah. to, to attribute to. And, yes. And in, and in others, I, I, very, you know, um, people use the word chameleon, I think, pejoratively. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I, I'm a huge believer in, in functionality and in contextuality. And it, yes. it seems that that's a similar trait you and I have is being able to to match in that way like i grew up in in hyper progressive environments in los angeles so like you most of that is moving around because of my passion for the church i've spent some time in some prison ministries and if you go mm -hmm. to prison ministry almost everybody there is dsa so you know when they're saying things against the cis heterosexual patriarchy or this that and the third you know that's not really my thing but when they spend the time of their day to write letters to people who are incarcerated yeah. Like that that's where I have a bleeding heart, you know? Yeah. Um, and at the same time, um, Ron Paul years ago opened me up to Austrian economics, which is how I got interested in, in that space. But I'm less interested in the abolition of corn subsidies, which probably should happen, and I'm more interested in sort of the atrocities of war and, <laughs> you know, what, what, what responsibility the foreign policy has and mismanaging its, its role as, as hegemon of the world. Indeed, indeed. Uh, no, I, when it, uh, not necessarily corn subsidies, agricultural policy, or American agricultural policy, because I guess agri global agricultural policy, and particularly particularly its effects on Africa, uh, is something that does interest does interest me immensely. But legalized that? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I, 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 as, as far as I'm concerned, cat is uh, Arab cultural imperialism. Um. <laughs> uh, but you know, it's not so much necessarily that issue. But getting to the weeds of economic policy is is what I actually do. Mm -hmm. um, but I share that sort of same viewpoint about trying to absorb different perspectives. Like I, I, I'm a weird person. I subscribe to I subscribe to first things, and I subscribe to uh, 
uh, The Lamp, which is this new Catholic journal. But I, also, I subscribe to The Economist. I subscribe to City Journal, which is the um, uh, the public the magazine of the Manhattan Institute. And I subscribe to uh, Jacobin. And I read them all, and I get they 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 have nothing in common, or very little <laughs> in common. But I understand what people are saying, and I try to get, get a better, better perspective of um, all the different issues of the day, and and people uh, just understand where people are coming from. And I think that's important. And I, you know, to be fair, I don't necessarily think that is the best way to go about doing that. It's very time consuming. Mm-hmm. I re- I read basically half of these magazines, so I don't have time, time to read them all um, on top of books and all the other work I have to do. Um, but I, I do think in our contemporary society, empathy is an underrated is, a, is an underrated trait. Uh, trying to understand other people's perspectives as opposed to trying to denounce them as fastly and uh, uh, vociferously as possible, um, and 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 not to and not to sort of um, Paradise that perspective, or 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 caricaturize it more accurately. Caricaturize with that. It's it's that we spend more time. We spend more time, I think, trying to understand why someone else is wrong, and like trying to find the holes in their argument and and uh, ca- ca- come up with counter arguments for what they're saying, as opposed to trying to understand their under their sort of theory of change, their way, their sort of worldview, and why it is they take their perspective. And actually, I think because what that does, as far as I do, is that that leaves you with a much more stronger understanding of what you know and why it is that you believe what you believe, as opposed to simply saying, "Okay, I'm going to start with this viewpoint. I'm going to figure out why I'm right." Um, and I, I mean, if you if we have the time for it, I'll talk about what I do here in New York and my act, my housing activism, which is a big part of yes. I guess I, I I want to get to that. I want to get to the housing. Um, mm-hmm. Open for all, right? Uh, open, New York, yeah. open New York for all. So what I wanted to get into right before that, because mm. I think you may not have been asked this before, mm. is when you're discussing this empathy, what comes to me, and this might be the old Western philosopher in me, mm. but I inherently think that people's ethics are inseparable from their metaphysics. And so we've mentioned it a couple times, one through mm. the mm. figure of Brunig, whom you mentioned, and, and once again now through one of the journals that you've mentioned, um, I, I'll let you kind of describe it yourself, but to to what extent, you know, do you affirm <laughs> Catholicism? Are you, you know, are you a Catholic like proper? Because there are people who are culturally Catholic versus who are in their adulthood, you know, after confirmation, still into it. And do you think that has anything to do with your with your empathy? Because even um, I do similar things, by the way, with journal subscriptions. I, I read the American Conservative as well as The Intercept a lot more mm-hmm. when Greenwald was there, but but mm-hmm. still. And one of my favorite people from The Intercept is Jeremy Scahill, who's extremely secular now. But you dig in his background, and he grew up in a household that was in one of the Dorothy Day houses of the Catholic Church, oh. the, the Catholic Day Worker House. Yeah, and I yeah. think that's very interesting that that drives his, his sort of uh, – righteous indignation which sets him apart as a as a person of the left because it still has this kind of residue of catholicism in it Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. interesting um yeah i i don't know um necessarily the degree to which i I have to imagine it does on some level uh particularly uh this the sort of social teachings of the church uh which 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 i guess definitely take off the harder edges of I, what you would call my economically liberal inclinations. Um, and it makes me, I mean, first of all, it does very much guide, for instance, my, my, my and I am someone who, I consider, my, I consider myself a practicing Catholic. And that, for instance, very does much guides me towards my belief, my opposition to say the death penalty. Uh, that, 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 that's, I think very much like if I were not a religious person, I don't think I, that's something I, I would, that's something I, I would have much less of an issue with. Maybe it's not something I would have no issue with, but it's something I'd have much less of an issue with. Um, but even beyond that, I think that understanding our so the, so the subsidiary nature of relations between people and the the sort of obligations we have as 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 members of a of a community that's not simply a, a human community but a spiritual community is one that obli- drives us towards an obligation to. You know, well, care for those who are less or less or uh, less well off, who who do not have the resources to succeed in the world today, and 
that is something I think that does very much um, stem uh, or flow, so to speak, from my from my religious views. But I, I, at the same time, I, I am one of those people who really I don't necessarily think like yes, often that's the question: Is a religious faith required to be an, an ethical person? I think I think religion makes it easier. It makes it a lot easier, but it's 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 not needed. Uh, but yeah, I'm too much of an individualist to talk about, yes. you know, what it requires. For me, it's not even about requirement because that's an extremely high bar. Let's go for a yes. lower bar. Mm. When we look at population groups, when we look at averages, yes, and you see the average person who's a practicing member of an organized religion, you know, right. Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, mm -hmm. Buddhism, versus the average person who is a member of a disorganized religion, which is really fulfilling the 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 spiritual thirst for the gods through politics mm -hmm. and and we see the olive branches extended from these two groups i think there are a lot less olive branches from the people who are aesthetically secular but i think deeply religious in their own way right. there's a there's a culture online of cut this person off uh yes don't, you know don't date a republican uh don't do this that like it's very much there's no redemption for the other side the other side are demons they're not humans so you don't interact with them and and yet with you with your practicing catholicism at least what it appears to me not it doesn't take away your agency as an individual to make no. those decisions but i think like you said it provides an environment in which hey maybe that person is redeemable hey maybe that's a human on the other side exactly. and 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 that's connected to an, and a good segue to what you said you're doing in new york and your passion for housing and it's funny a lot of people purport to be very pro housing for people. I don't know if you've heard what's been going on in Los Angeles right, lately, oh, yeah. and then you could tell me about New York, but they, there was a judge, I don't know in which circuit, which has imposed the, basically the shutting down of Skid Row. I used to live on Skid Row, um, not as a resident of Skid Row. I lived in an apartment, but every day I would, I didn't have parking cause it was expensive. It was like 200 bucks yeah. in, in LA. So I would, I would park in Skid Row every day. And, you know, I have many, many instances where I would run into, um, the indigent on my, on my way home. Some of them having funny conversations. Once with a woman, I was chased. Uh, if I wasn't with a woman, I probably wouldn't have ran, <laughs> mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, I've, I've been questioned. I've, I've had interesting conversations and I've given back as well and, um, and spent some time there. But, you know, for those who don't know, there's a movie with Jamie Foxx about it. Like it's like an, it's not just an encampment. It's like a, its own village. And, now LA I've seen in the in the Burbank area they they've got these parking lots and they're trying to like make it very it's regimented small, like putting small the tents homes. yes yes small. well well the, the funny thing is that in the past like celebrities and musicians have created these tiny homes and created yeah. tiny home villages but then the city comes and destroys them you know because they're against whatever because they don't have a bathroom of this There's size no or because of this plumbing isn't like this like because they have their perfect standard but in my opinion uh when you have the machiavellian analysis it's really because they're not getting a cut out of it because it's mm -hmm. sort, of, sort of pure donation but I've, I've talked enough about it this is your area tell me about housing in in new york and, and what you do with it no i think understanding of it as a sort of a rent seeking uh di dynamic is quite apt uh, because what you what we have here in, in places like New York, in places like San Francisco, places like LA, is that we've had a political economy that's aligned towards the restricting uh, rest, uh, restricting of home building, uh, and that's come under the guise of more community input, more community control, and e extending the process, deepening the engagement process. But all that served to do has really been to increase the number of veto actors. And if you look about the change, if you look at the, sort of the numbers, um, really starting in 1960, if you want to go back to the issue that housing crisis in New York, uh, you could go back to 1916 or 19, I think it's 1915, 1916, but it, it's much easier to go back to 1961 when we passed a new zoning code that dramatically uh, reduced the number of um, units that could be that it, it downs the entire city it reduced the amount of you could build across the city and you add to that the, the legacy of robert moses and the sort of the, the the dialectic between the robert moses and jane jacobs uh 
about the importance of community input. You've had a dramatic increase in preservation laws, dramatic increase in, say, community world community boards and different in, in engagement, and that's all meant to prevent a uh, Robert Moses type figure from being able to come in and slash through neighborhoods and demolish willy nilly. But what that has done is it's really it's empowered the most. Um, in not a political sense, but in a relative sense, the most conservative actors, the, the actors who really don't want things to change, the, and, and it benefits them, not just sort of socially or aesthetically, it benefits them materially, because when you have, when you restrict the housing supply to that extent, you know, it increases it increase the value of those that do exist. And so we've had a traumatic increase in, I guess, most of urban areas of, um, in New York, I think being the greatest, one of, one of the top three examples in the country um, of, of home values over the past three, four decades. And this status quo has served them very well. Uh, those who have been lucky enough to be been able to buy in. Um, but for those who are looking to buy in and those who are looking for places to live, it, it's been an utter calamity. And, and what, what we have had now is we, we're, we have a pie that is growing or much, much more slowly than the jobs pie or the population pie. Uh, and what that does, that, that, that creates a, a great deal of upward pressure on, house, on housing. So what we need to do, and this is where what we do becomes a little controversial, but I, I believe is very sound, is that we need to take an all of, the, all of the above approach. You get people, particularly on the left, who say, okay, in order to solve the housing crisis, we need to build more affordable housing. And what by affordable housing, they mean uh, subsidized housing or or, even better, or 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 exactly or even better to them, public housing. Uh, but almost no one is building more public housing anywhere in this country. Um, NYCHA, the New York um, NYC Housing Authority, is the largest uh, operator of public housing, and is really an exception to the trend of of unwinding public housing authorities across the country. Um, and if you go to those units, they're, they're run very terribly. They're terribly, terrible conditions. And um, they've actually had done some experiments where they really privatized the operation of, oper, uh, operation of those. And the quality of those have um, um, jumped to a very high, very quickly, very rapidly, and to a great degree, uh, the quality of those, of those units. But public housing is just politically uh, economically is it, not a viable solution. So what we are, what we really advocate for is an increase in the amount of market rate construction. And, and the way we really see it, see it is that um, by even though what the new units we are building are not necessarily affordable to the median per, uh, so the average individual, I say the medium, uh, median uh, household, what it does is that it relieves the out, the upward pressure on the existing housing stock. And in doing so, it makes the existing housing stock more affordable. Because if you look at the way displacement works, if you look at the way gentrification works, I, I don't want to uh, confuse you or your viewers by assuming you have that much of a knowledge of New York's geography. But, mm -hmm. you know, wh wh where we, where we're, the sort of the focus point of our, focal point of our activism right now is in Soho. Um, which We're is trying, in Manhattan? Is that in it's, Manhattan? It's Manhattan, and it, it's mm -hmm. really one of the most uh, uh, high-end districts of the whole city. And we're trying to get that area up zone to build more housing. Uh, but what happens? So let's say you know you're someone. You, so if you if you're trying to buy there, you are you are wealthy. Only work that 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 only wealthy people can afford to live there. But let's say you you want to live to Soho, but you you can't. You just it's just a little too much for you. So where do you go if you can't go to Soho? You go to Williamsburg, or you go to you go to say East Village. If you can't go to East Village, you go to Williamsburg. If you can't go to if you can't make it in Williamsburg, you go to Bushwick. If you can't go to Bushwick, you go to some place in Ridgewood, which is in Queens, and that's where the frontier of gentrification is at the moment. So it, it's really a, it's a what you have in these sort of high opportunity areas that are that are high income good access to jobs, good access to transit, is that if you can't afford to live there, you go further and further out. And this creates a ripple wave effect of, of, of displacement. So if we address it at the root, at the core, and, and by adding more supply in these high income, high opportunity neighborhoods, we will alleviate the pressures of, of um, displacement in further outlying areas. And 
And also on top of that, because of this mandatory, there's a, there's a policy called mandatory inclusionary housing uh, that was implemented a couple of years ago that stipulates that um, any uh, zoning change that increases the amount of units you can build uh, will require 20% of the units to be allocated as affordable, so below market rate. Mm -hmm. um, so anytime we do our rezoning now, there's in, there's affordable housing inbuilt, inbuilt on that. And that's a very, that only strengthens the case uh, because 20% of any, like in what's in Soho, if we're going to rezone, we're looking at approximately, I would say, 3,500 units that could be created in this. And so approximately 700 of them would be affordable. Uh, and if we could target the people, again, Soho is a big um, retail district, uh, lots of high-end boutiques. And so if we could target the people who are working there and people who are working in these kind of boutiques, you know, they're coming from, in, from, in from the Bronx, from Queens. Uh, they have hour-long commutes. If we could make some of those units targeted towards them, we would really not only uh, uh, mitigate the, the effects of this displacement, the, the wave of displacement, we would actually be enhancing the diversity and um, the, the diversity and inclusionary nature of the neighborhood. And and this is what this is. I guess goes actually goes back to what we were saying before about should we take a race based approach or a class based approach? Mm -hmm. Because by just by making it more affordable, by making it more uh, approachable, by by in, increasing the supply, you will actually make the area more diverse. Um, and even though you're not necessarily targeting race, uh, uh, you're not you're not specifically targeting race. It does achieve the same effect uh, in a way that's I guess that more amenable to uh, to log rolling and uh, alliance building. So so what we do is that uh, we, we go to we go to the community board hearings, the council hearings, uh, we we uh, speak at these we speak at these and make the case for why we should be building more and on specific projects. And we've grown I've been on the board for uh, since uh, 2018. That's what, almost three years now. Uh, and I've been involved since 2017, 2016. And uh, we've grown from really just being a more re a reactive group, that there's a project in some area that people are go coming up against for nonsensical reasons, and we try to make the case to what we're doing now in Soho, which is that we propose, um, we propose the rezoning, we draw the, like, we, we proposed it, we said, let's make about housing, and the city took it up. The city took it up, and they really, they, you look at the city's proposal, it's very close to what we proposed. And so we're just trying to get to pushing forward. So, you know, we've grown tremendously. Uh, we've done a lot in, uh, I think, a couple of, in just a few years. And uh, we're part of a sort of a nationwide movement, and maybe international movement, that is really, I think, understanding um, the housing crisis as one that's a, uh, as an economic issue. And I think is the defining issue of our time. And I think, and for me as someone who is, is somewhat, again, not left of center. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you get to the issue is that if you look at what institutes, um, what in, what inculcates conservative views is most the most powerful tool you have to do that is uh, property ownership. And if you have a generation like we we're faced with today of people for whom property ownership is is completely out of the question, you're never going to get them to endorse any kind of conservative value. And for, I mean, for us, it's not even property ownership. It's just being able to afford to rent somewhere um, affordably. But uh, once we expand and grow, the question is, OK, uh, people want to live in cities. People want to live in near cities. How do we uh, create a sort of a, 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 an urban pattern that is the most amenable to that? Yeah, I he I hear this ownership argument mm -hmm. in in terms of um I think it's a, a general George Washington Carver wing of black thought in the United States. I've heard it from an elder, Amdas Ion Hamilton, who was the first priest uh of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church in Los Angeles. He's a black American who, by the way, was a black Catholic growing up before mm. he um <clears throat> got into a lot of different you know, gang life prison came out right after the Watts riots in the 60s, did the Watts profits, did the Watts workers writing shop, um, this precursor to hip hop, did a spoken word mm. album, and then became an Ethiopian Orthodox priest. Wow. He, he would always talk about how education was a miseducation, mm -hmm. about how 
blacks were intentionally, uh, and you could put, he put intentionality behind it. You could put it behind it or not, uh, but intentionally put into integrated schools first and then pushed down the kind of college pipeline to disenfranchise them, which goes along with a lot of Killer Mike arguments mm -hmm. where he's made uh, amends with the Republican governor there in, in Georgia, I don't know his name, to reboot the trade programs in Atlanta and in the rest of Georgia because they needed and desired more black, less black uh, PhDs and masters, although, you know, there is a place for that and, and more tradesmen, more electricians, more yes. plumbers. And those people with and go very high the salaries will own. Yeah, they will own, they will own property the, the way that you said, and there's a certain amount of pride in, in community that, that they would have. So it seems like, super strong arguments i'm guessing only two critiques exist right the the one from the left the one from the right from the right it would be those people who are not interested in that inclusion that you're talking about and want their property values to continue to skyrocket yeah. from the left those people who have a dogmatic stance against market oriented policy exactly. as opposed to a market and uh, oriented policy that's going to get to the ends that they at least allege to be behind Right, right, and and I think I, I don't think any one person has ever said this. It's, it's sort of a it's a saying that sort of goes around in our circles. Is that that the socialist, the sort of left wing NIMBY argument or the counter argument? What we propose is that capitalism has failed, but it has somehow succeeded in already creating a, a sufficient number of houses across the board uh, for for our needs. That even though capitalism is a failed system. It, it has the number of units as created is, are, is already enough, and and there is no need to build more uh, because capitalism has somehow worked. It has just failed to distribute them to distribute them adequately or allocate them properly, which is I mean just given socialism, the history of socialists and states is quite ironic, um, and it's totally untrue. It's that it's that um, they're they're far. If you look at you compare our region in New York. Um, don't quote me on this, even though I'm saying it. Uh, is that like over the past since I guess since the recession, we've we've added about three hundred thousand new jobs, but we've built less than half of that in new units in the New York City region. So already, there's, like I said, there's a mismatch between the sort of the population growth and the, and the job growth that happened in in places like New York and the sort of housing creation. And that's just driven units up. And I think the, the, what makes this particularly acute to this time is that what we've had is that this is happening amongst a broader economic trend in this country where economic opportunity is concentrated or increasingly hyper-concentrated in a, in a small number, a select number of regions. So we're talking New York, we're talking Boston, DC, LA, San Francisco, Chicago, Seattle. In these areas, this is wh where the lion's share of jobs growth is happening, particularly at the higher end of, of skilled of the skilled work and high high skill work and um, the high, high well paying jobs growth is happening, and you know this is where people who are clustering, who are the most talented people, who are being paid the most, and they're really just bidding the price of housing up, and I think there's going to be a broader question. That I think. We have to try and solve that's i think really beyond our our mandate as an organization is that how and this is you see in britain they're trying to deal with the same thing too where it's just, over there's just one city it's just london uh it's like how do we rebalance our economy not just sectorally but geographically how do we spread out our economy uh in a way that opportunity is more evenly distributed across the land mass and that, that is a great challenge, and I think we're going to see. Uh, see remote next work is helping. Yes, I, we're going to see over the next couple of years just how much remote work is going to affect that. Mm -hmm. But already, I'm talking to a lot of people I know, several people in my, in my in my social circle. So I really, who you know, because I went to college here in New York, and most of us, you know, stayed in New York or went to grad school somewhere or else, and came back to New York. And now the question is, do we see our? Do I see my long term future in New York? Mm -hmm. uh, and I talk to people saying, well, you know. So once so I come from this town in, say, Indiana or wherever, and this couple big firms have branch offices there, and they pay decent salaries, and the house price, housing prices are much lower. I have family there, 
And is it worth like New York is great, but is it worth uh, trying to navigate that when if the, just there, there, there's an adequate number of opportunities back where I'm from uh, that I can make them, I could actually have a much higher quality of, of, uh, of life over there. And, you know, for them on an individual level, that, that's a perfectly rational and good decision. Uh, and honestly, when most people say that kind of thing, I, I encourage them saying, uh, go for it. Uh, but on a sort of on a macro level, if you're looking at this like as a New York City policy maker, um, the question is, this is every time someone makes that decision, that is your loss. And I think I don't you've probably seen this, this statistic that's been going around since uh, yesterday um, that New York, um, New York lost one seat in, in the apportionment of the most recent census census. And they did it by only 89 people. Had they, yeah, had they been that. able to come in, only 89 more people, they would have not lost the seat. And so well, how this, much more, how much more are they going to lose because of the, you, you're a survivor of the great migration. Everyone's fled to Austin and to Miami. Yes. Yes. And so, so I think that, that really emphasis, that the drives home, I think that's, that's a useful talking point for us because I think it really drives home the costs and what the stakes of what's going on here, which is that if you don't allow this kind of growth, if you push people away and you don't give them a place to live, where they don't create places where they can live affordably, uh, they go somewhere else, and that you lose that you lose the economic opportunity, you lose the cultural opportunity of these agglomeration effects of great minds coming together, creating new things, um, and and being ingenious, being innovative. But you, uh, the political, the real political costs to that as well. And now, and now they're gonna, now they have one fewer. Like I thought they're gonna lose two. So actually, this is much better than I was expecting. Uh, they, they've lost a congressional seat, uh, and you know, New York is the state that has lost the most congressional seats in history. Uh, they've lost fifteen from their peak. You know, they used to be the largest state in the union. They were for maybe a hundred years plus, uh, but. Um, I mean, things change. The West grew, but um, I think the housing crisis in, our, in this area is a big part of that. And I think it touches upon our lives in so many, so, so many ways. And for me, it's the final issue of our time. And that that's why I choose to concentrate my energies there. Thank you for that. I and I, you, especially when you're talking about the highly skilled workers, I think about the tech people in exactly. San Francisco, where I see them paying three to four thousand dollars for a one bedroom apartment, and you know their salaries are between one hundred and two hundred thousand. So it doesn't phase them that much. But when you when you think about three to four thousand, man, that's like the median salary in the United States yes. is how much they're paying in rent, mm -hmm. and so it's a it's a bit illusory the the actual high level of these high level the high level salaries of these highly skilled people it, there's a an illusory element to it so i know you got to go i don't want to hold you do you have anything to plug like can anyone give back to these cause or how would you encourage them to get involved uh, you know is it limited you said you have kind of branches or wings in, in other cities yeah uh so so you know open new york i, I would advise you all to, to just take a look at open new york uh our handle is open and why for all uh, that, uh, that's our handle across most social. Uh, I think our website is openNewYork.city, and uh, just check us out. And if you like us, uh, just, uh, we're, always, we're, we're always accepting contributions. We're, we're a 501 uh, C4 donations are not tax deductible <laughs> FYI, um, because we do political work. Uh, but, um, if, if, if it's something that interests you and, 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 and interests you and um, something you might want to get involved in your area, uh, we're part of the larger uh, YIMBY, Yes in My Backyard movement, uh, that I think has, I think by now has uh, various chapters. It's not necessarily a structured organization. We're, we're working on that. But um, there are various YIMBY groups in, I think, most major cities now. So if you just say Google, if you're like in, I don't know, if you're if you're in San Francisco, you, you Google the MBSF, you will find there's the MB actors. I mean, that's where it started. So if you're in the, if you're in the Bay, you've probably heard of it already. But yeah, just Google the MB your city, and and um, you'll just you'll probably find a group. And if you don't, get in touch with me, and uh, we can talk about how we can help start one up in your area. Um, but yeah, you know, I don't I don't have a podcast. I don't I mean, I have, I don't have that much to shill. So. Uh, no, that's good. That's enough. That's enough shilling. Thank you so yes. much. Mm -hmm.